And I asked a lot of questions of Frank Spotnitz and he assured me that that was not quite the case. And there was actually room for quite a lot of moral confusion in this role. And then he showed me the second episode, which was a secret, which is already written. And that's what sold me. But for a long time, I didn't read the book deliberately. I read as much early German history and accounts of what happened to normal people who consider themselves good in Nazi Germany. I read the rise and fall of the Third Reich. I read Albert Speer's Inside the Third Reich. I read the, you know, the book about him where he kind of got exposed. I read as much as I could. And then when we were like well into doing the series, I read the book and loved it and could see, you know, but we had the advantage of having Issa Dick Hackett as our executive. So it meant that, yes, the book itself is actually a rather short piece, but for the rest of his life, he tried to write sequels and accompanying works and these kind of acid inspired journeys into what other things the Nazis might be doing. So a lot of the more far fetched areas that the series went into was hidden canon that she, not only her, she had access to, but we had her blessing to do it. So it was a lot of her encouragement and she was one of the people that put it together. So I think it's very interesting that the, the wilder elements of the story that were held up as examples of veering far away from Dick's original work were mainly his ideas. That's fascinating and I, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I, so... Especially the Nuberwelt and going into the, the, oh, the tunnels to the other dimensions, all of that's in his writings on the subject with his attempted sequels and short stories on the subject. Yeah, it's well, amazing. I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I was going to get to this later on, but for me, the least favorite part of the novel and, and, and therefore, to some extent, the least favorite part for me of the series what was the mystical I Ching part of it. Not, uh, not that I have anything against I Ching, but this is just, uh, you know, a personal preference of mine. Yeah. I, I like science fiction <laughs> reading. It's plausible. Not yeah, that yeah. it's some kind of like mystical stuff that gets you into an alternate. Well, dimension. you know, when, when um, Philip K. Dick was struggling, um, he used various modes of chemical assistance to, to explore his imagination, but he was not averse to using the I Ching to write his books. So that's one of the interesting that that's he was using that to make story, uh, make stories decisions. You know, not always, but I know he did it, which is fascinating. So that's yeah. why you stuck with it. I'm afraid. Yeah. Well, that also is fascinating. That that so for him, I Ching was as natural as you know us using Google or something uh, as a form of research. To yeah. Get it was like the, the and, transcendental Google. As they yeah. Call it. And, and he uh, he felt uh, that um, that you know would therefore work as a vehicle in the in the plot of the story, uh, which makes sense. I think writers always write from their personal experience. Let, let's talk a little bit about Frank Spotnitz now. As uh, everyone uh, in the class and anybody else who's watching this probably knows, uh, over the course of the four season series there were what three uh kinds of showrunners or four because of the final three possibly season. four yeah yeah so frank spotnitz who actually had been working on this for years uh started... so often the case <laughs> this is what happens you know That's he did right. stay on as an executive but does that really mean anything? Because I've heard that- I think it probably meant something in terms of points for him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it I'm also is a show, a show of continued support and lack of sour grapes. I think it probably means something that he wasn't, you know, or if yeah. he was, he was still getting paid, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, for me, especially considering that my reason for doing the job was very much based on a conversation, a rather reassuring conversation that went quite de in depth about what the potentialities of this role was. Because the reason I did it was, you know, there's always been a certain frustration with me considering that I'm not that limited in my range. You know, I may well be, but not as limited as it might appear. And it's always the case that a majority of roles that come my way are kind of villainous. If they're really well written, who cares? Because anything that's well written oversteps, the pro it's, it's only really a problem with second rate material, <laughs> you know, because often, anyone who's just bad 
is in a script where people are just good. And that's generally kind of limited writing. Anyway, when I got offered this, I saw this as an opportunity to explore that polarity and that frustration through the medium of a character. Someone who was, who had an, alter, an alternate history inside them, the alternate history of who they would have been, and then the new path of who they are now, and the conflict between the external and the internal. That was interesting to me, if a little pretentious sounding. So one of the, the ongoing um, challenges was maintaining that when all the writers were replaced and the showrunners were replaced. So it ended up being quite a lonely exercise for me because there were very long points when only I contained and was fighting for the kernel of who my character was. And my main role was not only keeping my story, protecting my story, but directing my story. So I became very, very involved in stopping it from veering off because you get a new writer and often it's very tempting to use me as the ballast for the script, for me to be this kind of monolith of evil when that was the opposite of the reason I was there. So I was fighting all the time, politely, to stop being used to get them out of a corner narratively. And we spoke about it, this before. I was given a certain amount of freedom when they realized I wasn't fighting for ego, but for the quality of the script and people were responding to it. Ultimately, when we came to the end of the show, I could not continue, I could not win that battle. So by the end of the battle, the end of the, the season, the final season, I felt that my idea of the character was ultimately refuted so that they could bring the story to a close. And that's something that meant it was very frustrating for me, but I'm very, very gratified that I was allowed to push it as far in the direction as I could. I think of that role, that the, the essence of that role is the battle between where they wanted to go for narrative convenience and my push in the opposite direction created the conflict that who he was. <laughs> so in a way I'm grateful for it. You know, well, and I'm talking about working with really talented people with the best of intentions. It's just part of the problem that I made it difficult for them sometimes. And I could understand by just saying, sorry, that, that doesn't make sense. And luckily I'm experienced enough to be able to come up with solutions that did make sense so we could work together because somebody just sits there and goes, no, is a pain in the ass. Um, but uh, so I was kind of involved in it and very actively engaged. I'm sure it was frustrating for them. But as I said, I always do it politely and respectfully. <laughs> oh, well, that, you know, that you don't have to do so politely and respectfully, I think, if you're right. Uh, you know, but I think you did a great job. You, you didn't win the fight at the very end. But, uh, as you know, because we also corresponded about this. I, I first of all wanted, as soon as I saw the, the first episode of the first season, I loved the show. And as uh, you know, critics are, are supposed to be objective. That's not true. You, you know, for a variety of reasons, you have feelings about things, and then you write in support of those feelings. You, yeah. You're looking, and so I didn't want to say a bad word. Uh, about anything in the series. And so, for example, as you probably recall, there was a big controversy here in New York City because as part of the publicity for the show, yeah, they, were, they had like Nazi signs and people got upset because they couldn't see past the swastika. This is often the case, though. The, the, the way we dealt with the actual material was very, very sensitive. Where it became problematic was the promotion. Yes, that's absolutely right. It's a different company. That, you know, right. And I think they were even still trying to be sensational without being exploitative. It's a very hard line to walk, you know? It's, it's, very, it's very hard. But when I saw the, the end of, of the fourth season and I, and I you know, reviewed that whole season, I had almost nothing but good things to say about it. But, uh, you know, this sounds too strong, but I think it's true. In, in effect, they betrayed your character. Because, well, yeah, yeah, and in the narrative up until that, you're someone you are an American un, under the duress of you know wanting to save your family and you know the atom bomb and what with the conscience that was troubling him that I basically I considered that my 
my basic idea was not that he was essentially a good man or a bad man or anything. I wasn't trying to let him off the hook. What I was trying not to do was not let the audience off the hook. And every time a showrunner would try to make the point or a writer that actually this was because I was essentially one of those bad men, what they're doing is letting themselves morally off the hook. They're letting the watcher morally off the hook because the person watching can go, yeah, you see, I wouldn't do that, right? What I tried to, to hone down on every time is to show how someone who, can, who was like, let's say everyone is in the middle, everyone's gray, and things like fascism work by pushing down certain elements and eking out others so that a population of median people can turn. We see it happen. Germany was not full of all the evilest people in history. It was full of people. Yes, Nazism was started up by ingrates, you know, awful, twisted people, but all of Germany went, not all of them, but everyone is so easy. Like we're talking about some, someone who did not have moral luck. You know, that's why I pushed to play an alternate version of myself. Sadly, I didn't get the chance to explore him very much because they had a lot of story they wanted to cover. But I wanted to show that it's moral luck to a certain extent. Forgive the helicopter there, someone's <laughs> escaped. They heard you talking, and the the the, the last two showrunners somehow <laughs> found out about this. The last two showrunners found out about this conversation, and they sent out a helicopter to get you. <laughs> they, they, oh no, they, they're aware. Yeah, <laughs> they were, You know, I I, yeah. I didn't like I didn't complain in the background. I had very vigorous to a certain extent. I was accommodated um, as much as they could without getting off their story. Do you know what I mean? So the yes. whole, as far as I'm concerned, the end of my character's journey, really in terms of what I believed, was episode six, the fourth season, mm -hmm. when I came back from the other version. And then I discovered reading the scripts that my character, it had not affected my character at all because they needed him to forget and get back onto their story. So I was indulged, but it didn't affect, and I didn't give up, but it, you know, I, I'm still, very grateful for the job and very respectful of the people that I work with, but that was the reality of it. You know, there's only so uh, far you can go, unless you're a producer. Yeah, I, I thought, uh, you know, one of your finest moments is what you did on behalf of your son when, when you killed that, you know, Nazi American doctor. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that showed that you put people do, people all have their favorite murders of mine. Yeah, it's a great. It was a great murder. By the way, that whole uh, that whole uh, track of the narrative, the, the opening of the second season where they take that Paul Anker song, da, 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 in my hometown, and then, yeah, yeah. and, and Tom is like walking the floor, and he's looking at a couple of girls, and it's like totally normal until he gets in, inside, and then they have to you know get up and give the Nazi salute. Yeah. So, I mean, he was an ideal character also, and, and you're doing that, uh, you know, going that far to save his life, that made it clear to the viewers that there was a lot more inside you than we might have thought. Well, exactly. And I'd been secretly playing all of that stuff, not necessarily so the audience would know, but that it was there, you know? And that's the conversation I had with Frank Spotnitz. Early on, very early on, I knew there was going to be trouble with my son. And that was what sold me on it. And that's why I was very lucky because there was always that central conflict in the character that made him interesting. So, you know, so much of it is to do with the opportunities for conflict that are provided for you by the script. I know this, you know, I was very lucky in that sense. And, you know, I started with a kind of complaint about the difficulties of doing the whole thing, but I'm tremendously grateful for the whole job. And it was extraordinary experience, but you know, there's always something. And that was my little journey, you know? No, absolutely. And you did a masterful job in, in that very, very complex role. Uh, can you tell us if you're comfortable uh, about talking about this? I, I read uh, someplace that uh, Frank Spotnitz had said he, he left uh, at, in the middle or at the end of the second season because he had creative differences with Amazon over where the series was going. And of course, I as a viewer, uh, uh, as soon as you read something like that, I'd love to know what those creative differences are. It's difficult for me to say. I would say that, you know, um... Producers and executives tend to talk to actors the way divorcing parents talk to six-year-olds. 
So all I really know is that everyone really respects each other and they love each other very much, but for reasons that I can't really understand, Frank has gone to visit someone else for a while. Um, uh, I was aware, we were all aware that there were difficulties, you know, as to who was ultimately responsible for said difficulties where you know you never necessarily know and with the, the changeover of you know um you know i don't want to get into too much like how people were happy or unhappy with you know with replacements there's there's always going to be some you never know like for example we might be fobbed off with some reason you never know what the real reason is you don't right. you know so i i I could talk to you about any of the given problems from any iteration of the show and any of the pluses. Um, but as to why that happened, the interior subterranean machinations that led to it, whether they were justified, whatever, I'm sure in some sense they were. I like Frank Spotlitz a lot. And as I said, we had a great working relationship because he really listened to me. And, you know, I could talk to him on a Sunday. I would read the script and I'd have a lot of thoughts. And often it was necessary because often the writers, each episode was written by a writer who was new to the material. So something that I'd been looking forward to doing, like for example, playing the alternate John Smith, was being written by a, a writer who'd never written the series before, who who hadn't, who didn't, might not have the understanding of the show that a that a good fan would have, you know. So I always had input, and Frank was wonderful in that sense that he would really listen to all of us. It felt very democratic you know so i missed that but i managed to rebuild that with different showrunners it just took a while each time as to why that happened fucked if i know by the way so this show shows something i talked to the class about there's a radical difference between writing writing a novel or a short story where basically it's you the writer and at most an editor who, who could be a pain could be a help but but that's pretty much it you know, you and then one person, you know, maybe leaning on you to make some changes you don't want to make. And But uh, obviously a movie and even more so a television series because it's longer has all kinds of other cooks in there, you know, making the story. In my, in my experience, I've learned that one of my jobs, sometimes you read a great script and then you turn up on the day and it's less great. And I've become like a, cadaver dog for executive notes suddenly the writing there's this dead hand that you recognize um and i've become quite good at sniffing these out and i always keep early drafts because sometimes you see something wonderful be withered away and the poor writer gets so inundated that they can't tell anymore and often what happens is a, a lot of baby gets thrown out with a spoonful of bath water so you end up trying to work out what it was that's missing and you have to go back and part of my, if part of the thing that you can do as an actor if you have any kind of agency is fight for the writer's original intention and sometimes you might be up against the writer on that oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, rarely, rarely rarely but it's often the case that you i can trace it back to an original early note which has been um someone's solution has been forced so what you end up with is a load of body parts sewn together but with no connected veins or arteries. So you have to break the thing open again and check that, uh, you know, the, the, so the blood can throw through, through it again, that, that there'll be ghost remnants of old things that used to work that no longer do because something's been lifted out and no one's noticed. And part of my job in Man of the High Castle, for our jobs as the people who'd always be there, was to keep hold of story elements that, that obviously because they had a much bigger job to do um might get lost so yes i mean i i love stuff that is so cohesive that we don't have to get involved i love a cohesive script you know and this was great very well written but sometimes contradictory and you know like for example the writers would forget that i didn't speak fluent german and i get a scene or they didn't know so I get a, a five page scene in German because I conveniently improvised in the first season that my German was rusty because I thought if I improvise that line and the actor I was working with said, yes, I remember that you struggled. We put that in to get me out of having to learn German. And I also liked the idea 
of moving away from the lazy assumption, it made me more of a working American. A working American, it could be anyone who's suddenly not someone who's automatically fluent in German, which makes them seem so much more like the stereotype. Oh, he's German anyway, you know. But it, it was also sneaky to get myself to have some work. Yeah, well, that was a good strategy. And American Nazis are uh, certainly nowadays more frightening than the original. Well, uh, well, you know, this was early days before yeah. it was quite so, you know. Yeah, Trump. I'm going to get back to that in a minute, the connection of the man in the high castle to Trump. But before I do that, um, two quick things. I just want to say Eric Overmeyer, who was the showrunner for the third season, he yeah. often gets lumped in with the post spot in its show I, I thought the third season was it was an excellent season me too i mean yeah. I, I, I there were there's no season that i didn't really enjoy parts of i thought the third season was great you know i liked eric a lot i liked all of them actually you know and and eric by the way uh as i think i mentioned to the class earlier is probably now best known for his work uh as the creator of bosch which That's i think right. just completed its seventh season and they're doing a, a new series um, as far as writers and actors, Marlon Brando is famous for, he has a script, he has words, and he just makes up his own dialogue. And he got away with it to some extent after he became Marlon Brando. Uh, that is known now. Well, by the way, I once met Marlon Brando, I should say, at a, a conference, and there was a guy, he was in the audience, and there was a guy who was giving a talk, and the audience was complaining and booing, and Marlon Brando stands up and says, Give the guy a chance to, to talk, you know, and if you think he's making a, a stupid ass of himself, then you can say, sit down, you stupid bastard. But this isn't right. You're not, you're not giving him a chance. And, you know, the, the audience, when they heard Ron Brando say that, kept quiet. So it gave this poor guy like another 20 minutes oh, cool. piece. But yeah, but um, so how, did you ever go so far as to sort of, you know, you got so into the part that you just began speaking things that made sense to you? I mean, I, I, I know probably you're not supposed to do that, but. No, it's very, very much to do with the environment, to do what the working environment is, to do with the script, what your relationship is. You know, sometimes you work on something where the writer wants you to do that, you know? Um, and sometimes you'll know that every comma is, you know, sanctified, you know, that everything is, and no, it's, it's, um, I, you know, if the writing is really good, you know, that's really often not necessary. Man and I Castle, every script was written by a new writer. And with rare exceptions, every script was written by a first time writer. I mean, a first, you know, a first time on the show. And sometimes they come back and write another one, you know, but you would, dealing with a new voice for yourself often every time. And I just took it upon myself to just elide certain words, swap them around, because I was the one that was the character and I wasn't gonna suddenly talk in a way, but I would be very open about it. And I would always contact them and say, do you mind if I do this? You know, and if anyone was like really vehement, I wouldn't, it's, it wasn't a hill to die on, you know? And also this, if you're really respectful of people, you know, like, um, but, the, but it wasn't a problem with Man in the High Castle, you know, it wasn't. And, you know, if you're working with, um, you know, if you're working with Tom Stoppard, if you work with, you know, like, you know, a perfect, you know, a perfect thing when you see it, you know, often you can read something that's been written in a rush. You know, if you just take out one word, the thing has more flow. Often I'll just naturally do that. And if someone asks me to put it back in, I will. It might make me struggle. But yeah, I'm, I'm very very respectful of the writer you know and often what i've also discovered over the years is that if you want to remove something without having examined it you'll often feel that the thing you want to remove is the key to the line Interesting. the thing that is it's often the case in life <laughs> that the thing you're struggling with is the thing that you need to master in your life do not cut it without examination you know so actually if there's a bump in the scene that's the fucking scene, the bump. Don't ask to get rid of the bump, you know? Well, I like that. You know, the British philosopher Karl Popper says we don't learn anything when they're going well. We, we learn from our mistakes. We learn from those bumps, which is- God, I should be sense. a genius by now. Yeah, there you go. You're, you're a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> you're an actor. Yeah. Um, 
All right, let's let's turn. Uh, much as on the one hand, I hate to talk about this, but it's unavoidable. Let's let's talk about uh, Trump and the relationship with the man in the high castle that's been going on in America. I mean, if I hadn't thought about talking about that today, I couldn't help but talk about it because, as I'm sure some of you in the audience know, uh, today was the beginning of the uh, uh, congressional committee's uh, series of hearings into why and how that happened. I, and actually, that is the insurrection on January 6th. And actually, uh, I, I saw part of it. We didn't find out much about it, uh, why it happened, but we certainly got a lot of uh, firsthand information about what, in fact, did happen. And, uh, you know, the connection to the Nazis, to me, became apparent even, you know, before Trump, but only became e even more so because, it, you know, it gets back to what you were saying a little earlier. How did the Nazis, this relatively small fringe crackpot group, that's what they were thought of in the 1920s, how did they manage to take total control of the country to the point that by the 1930s you have Hitler uh, who moves from being chancellor to the, to the Fuhrer and so on. And uh, a large part of that answer resides with uh, someone by the name of Joseph Goebbels who, uh, very bright guy, he earned his PhD in 1922 from the University of Heidelberg. So he was like no slouch. He, he studied history, studied communications. He was Hitler's minister of propaganda and popular enlightenment. And you, you can at least say this for the Nazis, at least they were honest. He wasn't just a press secretary. It's all in Mein Kampf. Everything he did is in Mein Kampf, but no one fucking read it. That's right. And they all and, had it. That's, it's a terribly boring book. Yeah, it's a horribly boring book. And the and what Goebbels, you know, preached is just blatantly lie. That that you don't get that much from a small lie. Big lie repeated. That's right. And that's exactly, unfortunately, what's been happening in the United States with you know Trump. I, I won the election. You know that Trump, Mark, Mark, uh, Mark Maples um, said that Trump, the only book that he ever had always by the side of his bed was Mein Kampf. Yeah. I mean, I doubt if he read that either, but because he didn't read uh, mm. anything, but uh, he, he certainly acts as, you know, if he understood what Goebbels was saying. And obviously it's more of an instinct than a logic. But um, as someone who is acting the role of, an American Nazi in a very different uh, situation, of course. Uh, but you, as a human being, were seeing this unfold in America uh, as you were going into the second season and the third season. I'm wondering if you could talk about how you and you know the people on the set in general. Uh, well, one of one of my reasons for wanting to do it, it wasn't just the second season going into the first season. One of my reasons for wanting to do it is I've always been kind of interested in people's rationalizations and how people the need to heroize themselves as a, the center of their own narrative and what people's memories do to cushion them from reality and and how every time we remember something, we remember it according, according to the needs of that moment, and it transmogrifies into something that suits us and it's a survival mechanism. Countries can do that, you know, people do that. And what I was really interested in, as, as I've alluded to before, was the, was the story of someone, how do you tell yourself you're a good man and do these things, you know? And, you know, and people, the genocides have, have happened in, in America, they've happened everywhere and, you know, and what we do with our genocides is, or, or our terrible murders, we turn them into national holidays in England, you know, <laughs> that's what we tend to do. And um, I was very interested, not so much in Trump, but the people who support Trump, the people who, delight in the misfortune of the of the inhuman enemy and how that has been nurtured and developed so that you have just as you had in germany just as you can have in in any country if it's dealt with as i mean you know germany 
that was really about the November criminals. It was about the armistice, about the, 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 the fact that people felt there was a feeling that people had been betrayed by people who'd given away the nobility and the and the uh, of they humiliated the country this sense of humiliation having been robbed by the rest of the world that festered and was manipulated by hitler this sense very much this the sense of like similar to like a stolen election or you know the Ramonas in England. If Brexit goes wrong, it's because Brexit was betrayed by the Ramonas. This is a very powerful force that can be ridden to power. You know, and I was very interested, and this is, explains what what my reading was about. What story did people, normal people, who would have the normal predilections towards good and bad, like everyone else, would go this whole way and believe that they were victims? Like in Germany, the reality of war was kept from the German people. You know, Hitler came up with a, a phrase, Lugenpresse, which means lying press, fake news, same thing. He repeated it over and over and over again. He, he closed down the papers that wouldn't repeat. So everyone in Germany thought the war was a tremendous success. They didn't have rationing. They didn't, you know, it was only really when Berlin started to fall, the Russians started coming, they realized it's all been, I mean, the, 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 the war command knew that it was a disaster from 1939. They knew he was a terrible leader. He made terrible decisions. But what was it that made these people able to just completely buy into it and deliberately look away? And this, the, the process by which a certain section of humanity was dehumanized so that, uh, to quote, um, I can't remember that. The, I can't remember who said it, but you know, the reality of one third of the population will kill the other third while the other third looks on, you know. Um, and the idea in America or in England that that couldn't happen because we're not German, you know, but it's already happened in America twice, <laughs> you know. Um, um, and, and to see the similar thing, now everyone goes crazy when you compare anything to Nazis, it's like, you know, but what is very, very similar is what has happened to people's thinking in terms of the, the delight in the misfortunes of the perceived enemy, you know, and what, what seems to have just grown and grown, we were watching doing this series, is this when in the fourth season, there was, they the um the riots where they were burning stuff down that coincided with the same thing happening what isa dick hackett said was one of the interesting things is that we didn't put in things to be current sometimes we'd have to take things out because people would accuse us of trying to jump on the bandwagon of current events that we would have things that were so strikingly on the nose that in the end we took them out you know so for us, it was a very strong growing thing, not just about the advent of Trump, but the people who worshipped him and still do, you know, that just it's a reminder it can happen anywhere. It's not a comment about America. It's just humans. We, and this is why fascism is dangerous, because it takes normal people, as we all know, and it brings out the worst in them and suppresses the best. You know. Well, that's absolutely right. I mean, the only difference really between the Weimar Republic and the United States is that uh, there, you know, in the United States, we have whatever it is, you know, hundreds of years of democracy, yeah. albeit flawed, whereas the Weimar Republic was only about, uh, oh, I guess, you know, 10, 12 years old when Hitler took root. Because, yeah, but that, they used democracy to get rid of democracy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the students just uh, told me that uh, Nemo says that the quote was from Werner Herzog. That's it, it's Herzog, isn't it? Of course. Yes. That's right. Nemo is great, by the way. I'm thinking of giving her a job to just be like my student in every course that I teach yeah, yeah. From now on, because uh, you know, over this course, she, she always comes up with these uh, yeah. things that I just How could I forget that? Werner Herzog is. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about something completely uh, different. 
one of the things about the man in the high castle that uh, now doesn't seem to be, you know, such an amazing big deal. But I remember very clearly it was when th th that first pilot was shown on Amazon. And, and in, in, I think in a slightly ridiculous way, they asked viewers to vote. There were a series of pilots and the man in the high castle pilot won. How could it not win? But, you know, uh, but I'm wondering, uh, well, a couple of things. What it felt like to you as an actor to, to get this off at a star in a series that was going to be on Amazon, which at that time, Amazon was basically known for selling products and, you know, they, they had probably some movies and so on, but not movies that they made. And, and then I would gather that probably Amazon had very little to do with the series as it developed or, or did they? In other words, was there Very little to do. Very, very, they were very, very much hands off. I think they became a little bit more involved when things got a bit more scattered, <laughs> okay. you know, and the scatteredness didn't necessarily coincide with, you know, the low points of the series or whatever. But, you know, I think they it's often the case, their, their attitude was we'll only step in if, if things look like they're, you know, going off the tracks a little, you know, but they were they pretty much hands off. Yeah. Was it um, when it first started, it was like, um, you know, it's like being offered a lead in a series by Whole Foods, you know, it's like, um, which I, I would have taken, you know, like, you know, um, but, you know, people, but weird, by the time this first season was out, when you said people, you said to people, I was doing an Amazon show, they go, yeah, like it was already just gone from ridiculous sounding to par for the course. You know, it's amazing how quickly, so now no one would ever question, you know, um, if a milkshake company was making a thing about Martin Luther King, you'd still take it seriously, you know? Absolutely. Well, what Amazon did, along with Netflix, to argue that they're the third revolution in television. The first was television itself, network television, a smattering of local stations. Then in the 1990s, you have the rise of cable television. So with The Sopranos, they cable television becomes more frontline even than network television. And everyone thought back then that that's the way it would be for a long time. Yeah. But yeah. Within, you know, a decade and a half after, now the most cutting edge material is on uh, Amazon and Netflix. And you Netflix. say it, you know, a revolution in television, which may spill out, you know, kind of, um, kind of media spring like to, to um, a revolution in cinema. You know, <laughs> it's kind of cross pollinated. You know. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's true. Well, so a lot of the good, the great things on Netflix and Amazon and uh, Hulu are, are movies, not uh, they're movies that would not have been financed. Right, right. You know, and that that is a great advantage is to you know, um, that some of the commercial considerations w which would hamper, you know, more experimentation, you know, experimental television, like especially on networks, you know, that often you get the sense that something was having its weird bits chopped off so it resembled the shape in the wall you know that actually not just in terms of but literally in terms of the the, the length of time of an episode it doesn't matter if it's 45 minutes or an hour and seven minutes it doesn't matter anymore it's by the same token you don't have to worry about offending some arsehole and you know it's like it doesn't have to, they don't have to sell advertising space, which really makes a massive difference. Very much like the BBC always used to be, at least in England, because they don't have adverts. Um, they don't, there's a similar ethics, different ethic behind the work, you know. Yeah, that's good. I mean, and the other thing, you know, about streaming, and this was certainly the way I watched The Man in the High Castle, and as far as the students in this very class, they got this even more than I did, because I just watched each season, you know, all 10, uh, episodes, however many there were, like basically in one or two nights at most. Yeah. Uh, the, the students in this class have watched the four seasons uh, of that show just in the last, you know, maybe seven or eight weeks. So if you think yeah. about it, that what that has done is it's made uh, mm -hmm. television, a television series, more like a book where you can yeah. read as, uh, you know, watch as far and as much a as you uh, want. Did was it Amazon who decreed that there would only be four seasons or is that a decision? I think so. At one point, there was a possibility that the fourth season was going to be two seasons. But then I think they just decided they needed to cram it into one season instead. But you can, you know, um, 
you can't feel that all the way through, but that was what I think they managed that brilliantly. But there was one possibility, I think, where they were asking for for two more seasons and to, that they could wrap up the show in two more seasons. I think Amazon said yes, but one. <laughs> I think I think that's what happened. That's interesting, and there's no arguing that. I mean, I know that as an actor you couldn't argue it, but like no, but I I wasn't sure. I I'm not someone who um wants continued employment i mean i want i want i'm always about the new thing i didn't necessarily want to continue also you know i felt i knew where the character's natural end was it didn't end where i thought it naturally would um you know um and and, and just to be clear i didn't think that the character was going to turn good so much as see what he had done and not be able to turn it back in a tragic way you know right that the, she's some kind of shape to it um, that he had to face, you know. Um, but uh, sorry, I've got lost. What, what was the question? <laughs> uh, good point. Don't ask me. No, <laughs> no the uh, question. You'll probably get a note in a second right. saying what my point was. Me. No. Right. Nemo, what was the question? No, the, uh, <laughs> the question was about the ending you know, of the series after four episodes. Or oh, was there any argument? I just, yeah. you know, for me, the, the last thing I would have wanted was for it to be eked out beyond its natural life, definitely with my character, especially if that was the case. The only way they could have extended my character was to reset him in his thinking, because there was only one natural conclusion where it was going. If there was to be another four seasons, it'd have to have me like forget and it would have to be the writing would need to be bad for me to survive. Interesting point. I mean, I thought you mentioned very early on uh, in this interview, you know, the alternate worlds and not being I Ching, being it, you know, something you could actually go to via transportation system that in this case, Nazi Germans had uh, developed. That has all kinds of possibilities. I mean, because when you're dealing with alternate worlds, you can have all kinds of characters. No, I mean, that I'd be into. The, the kind of leap of imagination that would allow me to play different versions of the characters, absolutely. But not the version of John Smith that learnt nothing and just stayed a Nazi so they could keep the other characters going. I wouldn't be interested in that. I'd, I'd have gone. All right, well, that, that makes sense. All right, let's just bring... Unless I was really broke, which is out of state. Well, there you go. I mean, you know, that's an important... A joke. A joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that could be broke for sure. Um, let me just say a couple of things in conclusion, and then we'll, we'll go to some uh, student questions. Uh, one, j j just to circle back to also something we talked about. So obviously, John Smith is not in the original novel. and But not only is John Smith a major character in the in the television series, John Smith is the most important character in the television series. I mean, the only competition that Smith has is who Juliana, and you know she, she was a very important character. But I, I mean, that's an extraordinary thing, and I and honestly, I think it's due both to the writing and to your portrayal of that character. Well, thank uh, you. But I think what I was saying before is I think it's actually due to the central conflict of the character because it's the living embodiment of um, what would you have done? The question where people say, what I would have done in Nazi Germany is this, it's that in, in flesh, you know? So it's fascinating in that regard. And that's why I didn't want it to ever be because he was a bad guy, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, back in the 1950s here in the United States, I don't know if you're aware of it, uh, Possibly some people in the audience might be. There was like an idiotic question that uh, I get. I think the Republicans. What else is new? They sort of sent this question out there into into the world. And the question was, would you rather be red or dead? And and what I was trying to get at is, oh my God, communism is so bad that you're better off being dead than being in, in some kind of communist country. And I was just a kid then, and I was thinking back then, I still feel this way. What an idiotic answer to that. Yeah. I, I now, it's, now it's better dead than well read. <laughs> <laughs> but I would rather be read and not just a you know, bad sunburn. Okay. I would rather live under a communist regime than be dead, mainly because if you're dead, you have nothing, right? But if you're alive, in a red state, I mean, a stupid expression anyway, but in a communist country, you can live perhaps long enough to overthrow that 
government and and then have both so yeah. but but in a way uh you know that that relates uh to the decision that your character john smith made because you know after washington is bombed and and everything is in ruins he, he could have joined the american resistance or whatever and would have been wiped out and his family would yeah. have so yeah. you made the decision uh you know if, if red in this but case, then but then corruption continues that's the thing it's not like yeah you know. yeah no it's not as simple um all right so last thing um i just want to give a plug to your current uh movie that is a movie that just came out uh, i think last week uh mm -hmm. it's by m night Shyamalan, who is best known for the sixth sense and he's done a whole bunch of other movies he had his second movie uh it's called Unbreakable, and the past few years he has expanded that into a trilogy. Um, and now he's come out with a totally new movie, Old, which, uh, apropos of what we were just talking about, I've now become such a cheapskate, but in addition, you know, because of the pandemic and all that stuff, so I haven't actually, my wife and I have not got out to the movies in like five years, uh -huh. a year and a half. So with, with that in mind, tell us a little bit about old, how you feel about it, how it's going. Well, it's a kind of, it, it was an extraordinary script. It was in the middle of um, the pandemic. And I was originally going to go and do um, Baz Luhrmann's Elvis film to play Elvis's dad. It was an interesting character in a certain way, you know. Um, but then it transpired after we were there to rehearse. Tom Hanks came down with COVID, as everyone knows. And then the film got bumped by a month, but the difference was um, there was no traveling back and forth and no visitors for five to six, possibly seven months. Too long to be away from my little girl who's seven, my girlfriend, et cetera. And I luckily got another job, which was M night. And it was two months in Dominican Republic, all set on a beach. This disparate band of characters find themselves on this beach. And not quite sure how they've, whether they've, you know, booked themselves a holiday or been manipulated into it. And this beach has some strange properties that in it, um, it speeds up the aging process in a way that is horrifying. So the children, they notice that the children, when they run away, they come back and they're a couple of years older and only a few minutes have passed. Um, and what is also the case is that these characters, one of the reasons they've all ended up there is because they all have various maladies, which are also accelerated in their development. Um, so my character is a doctor who has a, very glamorous, much younger wife who's into the kind of Instagram life. And you, know, you can even tell from the way he's dressed that she probably buys all his clothes on Mr. Porter. And, and they kind of try to make it look good from the outside, but there are deep, deep problems with this character that he's suffering from a, um, an illness, which comes out and very much affects the story. And it's a kind of horror mystery, you know? Um, it's very interesting. It's dividing crit critics right down the line, which I think is quite fun. Um, um, I think it's I think it's great fun and very, very some of the filming in it is extraordinarily beautiful and brave. And what I appreciate appreciate about him is he's a risk taking filmmaker. And this is a risky film, you know, I think in, in many ways it really succeeds. Um, I think it's a lot of fun, very proud of it. And also had a great time in Dominican Republic for two months, but tried not to post about it and piss everyone off because everyone was locked inside while I was on the beach. <laughs> the evidence is out now, so I have to admit it. Yeah, there you go. Well, so actually, in a, in a way, it's just taking the reverse tack of cocoon, which is where old people become young. So you <laughs> exactly. This is, the, this is the other side of the coin. Yeah. Uh, but um, he, he's, a, he's an extremely talented uh, director, and, and yeah. you know, I, I wish the movie success because, again, in terms of what we were talking about, uh, the, the ascension of streaming, and which has just become much more so during the lockdown, has really instilled in people uh, a, a comfort with that. And it remains to be seen, you know, how the traditional movie theater fares in, in the years ahead, even when the pandemic is over so yeah yeah we'll see yeah i mean the 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 death of movies of movie theaters though when television came out in the 1950s there were a lot of people saying no one's ever going to go to the movie it theater. limps on <laughs> all right they were wrong all right it's 358 let's uh go two minutes earlier to uh questions and let's go first to any student questions you add if you want to just raise a yellow hand i'll i'll call on you 
Uh, okay, Nemo. Um, so first of all, it's an honor. Allegedly <laughs> Nemo. <laughs> oh, please, no. Um, it's an honor to be able to speak to you, but the first time that I saw you was in Victoria as Lord Melbourne, and then in Mrs. Maisel um, as Declan Howell. Yeah. And coming into Man in the High Castle, having seen you not in your villain roles, yeah. was made John Smith an incredible character to watch. The way that you can carry sadness in a character, I was so, so impressed. And I was just wondering if there were any times on any of those three sets where you had kind of like, cause you were focusing on the conflict of John Smith, I know. Um, and if you ever felt that sometimes it almost got like too real, because I think in all of the, all of the three things that I've mentioned so far, you've had a very poignant, quiet sadness that affected your characters and you did them really well. So I was just wondering if there was ever a time where you had to take a step away from acting because I'm just really invested in the way that you portray sadness. Oh, well, thank you. I, I don't know if it's something that I had to step away from or something that I kind of, it's a very, um, I don't know what, you know, it's getting into the thing of why I got into acting in the first place is actually, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's easier to actually explore things and give into them and feel safe to let things come out when I'm doing it with a mask somehow that, you know, as Oscar Wilde said, a mask, give a mask, a man a mask and he'll tell you the truth. You know, that actually this, I find something quite liberating um, about doing it. And, you know, the thing is, it, it wasn't with John Smith that I was trying to concentrate on the conflict. What I was trying to concentrate on was his humanity, actually, and his empathy and all of the positive things and how those things can curdle, you know, and all of those things so that it wouldn't, it would be difficult to distance yourself from him, you know, for understanding. I mean, I loved playing Lord M at the time. I had done one season of Man in the High Castle and he offered me this part because I'm someone who, you know, most at home in comedy to tell you the truth and kind of silliness. And there isn't a type of role that I feel is, you know, my thing. But because I think of early roles and because of my bone structure and stuff, people tend to see me a certain way. So it's so gratifying for someone to have to adjust to seeing me play a bad guy <laughs> rather than the other way around. I mean, you know, people would say, oh, I could never believe him as a good guy. And then they saw me in Lord M and they changed their mind really quickly. But for me, that was the first time I'd, for years I'd been able to play someone I just thought was really sweet and nice. And no further from me than, you know, I'm not gonna say Lord M is me and John Smith is not. It's, it's a bit more complex than that. And Declan Howell, I loved doing that so much. I loved doing that. I mean, I don't drink anymore, <laughs> but to revisit that world, and even my first scene was in McSawley's in New York, where I used to drink. And I went there and I had to jump up pretending to be drunk and do, do all the poetry and stuff. The, the barman, the manager remembered me and it was like, Rufus, haven't seen you in a few years. And like, oh yeah, I've been away. Like, um, but for me, it was a kind of joyous experience actually. But I know what you mean about the sadness, but it's a very, actually a very kind of, um, for, for, for Lord M, it was a really kind of melancholic resting place for him was that kind of inherently, because he was someone who would make people happy and was jolly and sweet, but it came from a kind of melancholic, sadness someone who'd made their peace with their sadness you know and that was just kind of his center and i didn't mind being there actually you know thank you for the question yeah good question i'll just add you know apropos of alternate history i think a lot of fans of victoria were hoping that despite real history that somehow lord m got together with uh, yeah but but you know in the same way that i didn't want to stay on as george smith that i was quite john john smith i was insistent that lord m would die because the energy of that character was about someone just on the edge of decline having their last great not love but you know stimulation the last sense of usefulness the idea that i love the fact that the character was popular 
but when they start talking about trying to bring me up bring me back on as what i would describe as a kind of magic granny dispensing advice from a bath chair you know for christmas specials i just thought i would rather just not work for a while um and they even when i did the death scene filmed it in such a way as it didn't wasn't clear that i was dead which really pissed me off because i said i'll do it on the condition that i die you know um so for me that the the what was great about it was its limited shelf life that character you know the idea of continuing in that would kill it i thought you know again if i was unemployed and broken up i'd change my mind and come back but you know never say never absolutely but there's something about these british you know productions because one of the best parts of the crown was winston churchill in his really old age you know still yes. being able to dispense this great advice and as you just so aptly put it like so sort of right on the edge i mean he, he's just on the verge of losing a, a lot of his power i mean physical mental yeah. power but his mind was so sharp and that was one of the best parts of yeah that's i didn't want to be brought on to give advice to her for you know every once an once a season <laughs> well, this, that, this is the difference again between science fiction and science fantasy and why i like science fiction better because in science fantasy that you know if that were a science fiction story they would have had the character come back like yoda and basically you know this uh holographic image part in his head yeah. Like, yeah. Makes no sense in reality. All right, how about another question from another student? By the way, you know what I do in my classes when students don't ask questions? Uh, you pick them. <laughs> right, I wreak havoc. I, I just I just pick on a student as a clear blue sky, and so that's what we're going to do. Uh, Throw me in the deep end, yeah. yeah. That's right. I'll be gentle with them. Okay. Anybody uh, have a question? Any students? Ah, uh, oh, there's one. Okay. Um, I'm I'm not sure if Charlie has his audio available at the moment. He's driving okay. back from West Virginia, so I have his questions in the chat. Go ahead. Okay, so this is Nemo voicing Charlie's question. Go ahead. Nemo. Have you played a good number of villainous characters. Do you feel like you're drawn to playing villains? Nope. Do you feel like your character? I'll go more into detail. Do you feel like your character's motivations have changed throughout the seasons, or have you remained well? Okay, so first question first. Am I drawn to villainous characters? Absolutely not. I'm drawn to like a, a like um like a light meter. Um, I always see grey. You know, so if I'm playing a character that is whiter than white. I'll try to find the dark bits. If I'm playing a, a part that is written as darkness itself, I'll try to find the light bits because people, as Marlon Brando used to say, it's polka dot world. If you zoom in close enough, you can see there's white and black, white, black, and a drawback, you know. Um, no, one of my, one of the things that I have to work around is the fact that a majority of the work that I'm offered is of a certain stripe. If it's well written, I'm not bothered. But the problem with that is my actual strengths lay elsewhere, lie elsewhere. That my my strongest suit, and I've heard people say this, and I think bollocks, you're not funny. But um, my strongest suit is actually, you know, comedy, character work, you know, and I can do this stuff, but it's not my strength. So the downside for me is I don't often get an opportunity to do what I'm best at. That's why Marvelous Mrs. Maisel was great, because they contacted me, they'd see me in theatre and said, we feel sad for you having to play all these baddies all the time. Can we write something for you that's more fun, like the kind of stuff we've seen you do on stage? And I said, yes. You know, um, and the thing is, people think I'm being clever when I do that. No, I'm being clever when I do everything else. That stuff's easy for me, you know. So the frustration for me is trying to find a route through the career available to me that is entertaining and if you only really get offered a certain type of role and only one out of five things is good it means there isn't a preponderance of work coming my way you know it means i don't work as much as i would because i have to choose through lots of very limited things most of the time i'm not saying i'm unfortunate but that is just everyone has their thing that's mine and i think a lot of it has to do with coloring and blah blah blah, blah. um in terms of um, 
in terms of did my motivations for John change, day-to-day -day motivations seem to seem motivations always, but his motivations, like most people, was to survive, keep his family safe, you know, but then motivations that are secret to us are quite, you know, there's what you want and there's what you think you want and what you tell yourself you want, you know, and I think the Smiths would, he started off telling himself that he was wanted to protect his family, but he ended up wanting to keep the stuff he had. And this is what happens with people. This is what happens with supremacy. It's like, you don't want to let go of your shit. And you might tell yourself, sometimes it's like a kind of um, an alibi that you'll say, I do this for my children. Really? Do, is it all for your children? The, the car, does it need to be that car? Does it need to, you know? And I think he's someone who, and this is why the scales falling from his eyes is something that up to a point I wanted to play, was this is someone who realized that even though he told himself that all along he'd known the truth, much like um, Albert Speer, the terrible truth that he told himself was a lie. The real truth was worse. He'd found a, liv a livable, a live withable truth to keep as a, an interior secret that was actually a replacement for a much worse one. So that's a kind of complicated answer, <laughs> but that's my answer. I just have a quick follow up uh, question on that. You, I often hear actors say, uh, you know, that, that he or she prefers theater to, you know, film or television because they like the live audience. Uh, I, do you feel that way also, or? I've always preferred theatre for the only reason that I get better parts. Um, you know, I, I it was I love doing theatre. Um, I do love doing theatre, but for me, it might not just be that, but a large part of it is honestly that the the best parts I've played on stage, really fabulous parts that that which I feel totally utilised that are beyond just beyond my grasp. Um, that is not always i'd even say often it is rarely the case on film and television i hope that it, it changes i mean things are i'm pretty lucky now things are kind of i'm happy with the way things are at the moment but it has not been the case that i've been overstretched in the things that i'm asked to do on screen um and i am regularly overstretched on on stage in a good way and so i prefer theater for that reason i would like to be able to say something different in a couple of years time but i'm still i'm still happy Oh, well, you're still young, so you have... You have <laughs> um, I'm younger than I look to the end of old, anyway. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, just w on that uh, point, are, are you the kind of actor who prefers some time off between parts, or do you just love, you finish one thing and hey... You're I have too much time off, that's what I'm saying. It's like, okay. you know, the, uh, I, uh, I would like for a while to go from job to job. I mean, if I could have a month off between jobs, that'd be great, or two months off. But in my experience, it's seven or eight months. I mean, when I did old, I hadn't worked for a year, you know? Some of that was waiting for the right project, and then it was COVID hitting. So, you know, like a lot of people, but it's not unusual for me to go months and months and months and months and months waiting for something that's good enough to do. And I'm not that fussy, you know? It's like, it's not that, if there's part, there's script, there's director, there's cast, and you can ignore location and money. Okay, so just saying one of those <laughs> is enough to consider. Two, I'm probably going to do it. Four, that's a career. You know, it's very, very rare that you get over one of them, which is all four, was the father, Anthony Hopkins. So I'm very, very lucky to even do that once. It maybe happened to me a couple of times, you know. It's not something that is owed to me just for being an actor. The fact that I was lucky enough to be in something that I consider perfect, you know. So if, if I get one of those every 10 or 20 years. <laughs> but no, I would like to be, I'd like to consider myself overstretched for a while and try that out. That makes sense. Um, Maybe you can tell us a little bit about why do you turn down parts? I mean, if you do you turn down parts because you think it's not an important enough part in the movie? No, I turn down parts if they're execrable. Okay. If they're absolutely mind-bendingly, toe-curlingly, eyelid-singingly appalling, 
and small with a terrible director, dreadful actors in China for six months. Those are the kind of things I turned down. If it was New York for six months, I'd think about it. <laughs> I, I, I exaggerate. But no, we're not talking about masterpieces that you've all seen that I decided not to do. I'm talking about things that you just can't do. Um, and everyone's, I'm not saying that the majority of things, but when I turn things down, it's because I just can't do them, you know? I mean, look at my, look down IMDB. I, I'm not that fucking fussy, mate. Do you know what I mean? That The stuff that you see there, that list of turkeys, is things I decided to do instead. So bear that in mind. <laughs> I didn't think it was a list of turkeys. <laughs> no. I, I thought it was a, a very impressive list. Yeah. Okay, so just one final question on, on that particular point, and then we'll get some other questions. Did you ever regret not taking a part because it turned out that it was better than you thought it would be, and the movie or the television series was lauded? Um, yeah, a couple of times, not better than I expected. And I, I normally had my reasons and they didn't change, but they often turn out to be good films, you know. Um, but it's a, it's a good thing to stop you from being too, too much the victim of your own story is that there are plenty of times when it was my bad luck and not my fault that I didn't get a role and because they didn't see you, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, we've all got those. But for every couple of those, there's one that I fucked up. So it's good to keep you, or not keep you, but at least keep you in like passing acquaintance with some humility about it. Like that actually, yes, like a lot of actors, I've got my coulda, shoulda, wouldas, but then there's the things that I made bad choices on. And I'm not gonna get into specifics, but it's a good thing for me to occasionally remember that, that, there are a few times where the Planet Alliance has said, okay, we're going to give you this one. And I went, no, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think it's a very valuable lesson. And not only, not, not to stop me from making the same mistake next time, but I may well, but at least to make me have some gratitude for the fact that I've been pretty lucky. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, the equivalent for me is, you know, I'm always asked to do interviews, usually about, you know, the media and stuff like that. Uh, and as my family will tell you, I never say no to an interview. Yeah. So, so for example, I was on the O'Reilly Factor when he was on yeah. Fox and people saying, what the hell are you going on his show for? And I said, right. well, you know, I get a chance to aggravate yeah. people who disagree with me. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, so, and I, you know, I, I once got a call from a 12 year old kid working on his, uh, not even high school, junior right. high school. Yeah. So, hey, yeah, I'll do the interview. But admittedly, that takes far less out of me than, than going in uh, for a part. So, yeah. all right, looks like we have a question here from Sal, and uh, it's in the chat. Uh, I'll just read. Uh, I got the impression that in the series, the films containing a different reality are a metaphor for people's imaginations and therefore possibilities of a different outcome or reality. Hitler used newsreel films and other media to create an image of a false reality to sell to the German people and break the wills of enemies, agree or not. I'll just make one point here. I thought one of the great improvements of the television series over the novel is that you, you may recall in the book, The Man in the High oh. Castle, right, it's, 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 it's printed. And, and that's something that is the alternate realities. That's something actually that goes at least as far back as George Orwell, 1984, where there's like mm -hmm. a, a track that tells, what is it, the Epstein or Goldstein track is like, tells yeah. the truth of what happened. But I thought that the series did a good job in, in making that alternate uh, flow of information newsreel clips. I thought that- Yeah, I, I always thought that actually one of the, I won't call it luck, but one of the things historically that happened just at the, the best worst time for our series was the incidence of time splitting off in a different direction when Hillary Clinton did not win the presidency. That thought experiment that we were living in occurring, that kind of terrible thought experiment occurring at the same time as our show about history splitting off I think consciously and subconsciously added a kind of element to the watching of the show. For me very much, it was something I was conscious of. 
that the idea of a point at which a crossroads where a direction was taken, where an other direction could clearly have been taken, which would have had massively different consequences. So I think everyone had, everyone watching had a very clear sense of, of the potentiality of something like that. Yeah, well, listen, that science fiction, you know, this, the kind of science fiction that deals with alternate histories and time travel, it's a very, very common thing that you, that someone goes back in time to do something that changes history and, and makes it branch off in, in a way that it was not meant to. And, and the obvious- Someone goes back in time to be interviewed by Bill O'Reilly and who knows what will happen. <laughs> But, you know, I, I couldn't help it. I, I would never have written a story like that because I, I, I like a certain amount of optimism in my story. Yeah. <laughs> but it certainly occurred to me, you know, hey, if there was such a thing as time travel, Trump became president because someone did that and, and knocked Hillary out of exactly. winning. You know, but I hate to even say that because that makes me sound like the democratic equivalent of, of those people. Uh, yeah, you know, no, uh, exactly, uh, exactly. So, um, any other questions from students uh, or anybody else at this point? Um, all right, here, okay, Ricky. Yeah, uh, sorry about the camera not being on. I just got back from work. I'm kind of disheveled right now. So uh, this might not make a lot of sense, but I guess um, my question would be, you know, being in the business, uh, you're de you, I, I gotta say, you have a great sense of humor. You're definitely, great to listen to and talk to so um i guess i would say uh what's if there is any difference what would the differences be between you know being like uh on the set and you know i guess somewhat involved in the making of a show like man in a high castle compared to you know uh more like lighthearted or i guess uh comedic projects is the way to say it i'll put it this way comedic projects are a lot more serious i mean in my experience, and this was very much the case with doing The Father, I don't know if you've seen that, but, you know, not a light and fluffy piece about dementia with Anthony Hopkins, that that was the most lighthearted and fun and loving, enjoyable experience I've ever had on set. People who'd done their work, who did not need to make a display of their process. We just told stories, we had our meals together, we hung out, we did, our, did the scenes, and we just... A, a, a collection of people who all had the same sense that the most productive atmosphere was um, a safe, friendly, warm atmosphere. And I always believed that, no matter what the subject matter. And as one of the leading actors in Man of the High Castle, one of the privileges of playing a leading role is to be able to set the tone for new people to come in about how you behave, how you treat people, what the atmosphere was like. And it was always very respectful of the subject matter, obviously, but in terms of how we dealt with um, the day-to-day, -day, it was a very pleasant experience. One of the strangest things is that in order, you know, I've always felt this way about costumes, is you have to break down the specialness of your costume until it just becomes the shit that you wear. No matter how fabulous it looks on the first day, whether it's a Elizabethan finery or a Nazi costume, or whatever, you just have to, has to be clothes. One of the things that happened the first time I wore my uniform in Man I Castle, when I stepped out in the hallway, everyone just shuddered and would step back, you know, and you could feel that kind of power knowing that as soon as you appeared, there would be a, a visceral reaction. Within a couple of days, you walk down the corridor and people go, hey, Ruth, right? This, this necessary process for us to feel like our environment, the chair emblazoned with, you know, eagles and, you know, Nazi paraphernalia was just why I sat. My costume was just my clothes. Picture of Hitler, the boss, you know. And that necessary process of just turning it into... You know, today's horror is tomorrow's background noise, you know, that it's just we would have to consciously deprogram ourselves from that before we went back into society. Because I, I became what we call swastika blind you could, because they were everywhere. You didn't see them after a while. And I've said this before, but it was like a terrible set to steal props from because things that look really beautiful, you realize they just had swastikas all over them, you know. So it was um, interesting that in order to operate, you have to just make it 
invisible. But then at the end of the day, you always have to just take some time to, to, to give, give some respect to the enormity of what you're dealing with. But day to day, it was, um, I made a lot of friends. We laughed a lot. I don't, don't want to sound disrespectful to the subject matter, but humans are humans. You have to, you have to get through it. Yeah? All right, Rufus, are you still there? And that is it. Okay, froze, you froze on my screen, but... Uh, okay. Um, so, okay, you, you just froze, Rufus, but it's a good shot that you froze on. Um, Webinar? Yeah, I, I tell you what, as long as, uh, as, long as you can uh, still talk, we'll, we'll keep talking. Oh, oh, there you go. Have I unfrozen? Um, you unfroze, great. I, okay, excellent. Um, so yeah, I think that what you just talked about is very important. There, there's sort of a normalization that naturally takes place when you're acting a part. Uh, but the, the, yeah, the, the point that I was the wanted to make is that that's a perfect example of what happens to people's minds. There's a perfect example of how these things take root incrementally. The normalization of micro horrors until you have a new reality that you accept, like, you know, like the fish, the fish that says to the other, what's the temperature? Um, it's nice water today, isn't it? And the fish goes, what's water? You know, that's the environment that you're in. And it kind of happened to us to a certain extent. You know? Yeah, this gets back to Marshall McLuhan's point was that a fish doesn't know anything about water because the fish is totally immersed yeah. in, the, in, the, in the water. Uh, uh, let me just get uh, to another question I saw here. Larry Q, th this should be an easy or maybe difficult question to answer. Uh, Larry Q wants to know what is your Rufus's favorite scene in Man in the High Castle if you had to pick a scene? Tough question. Um, I don't know if I have a favorite scene, but the moments that I always looked forward to the most were the moments where I could just really disarm the audience by just being a normal dad. Those were the ones that I think were morally and politically the most telling. You know, the, the moments where I could, I mean, I had a big, there's a scene when I'm sitting with my, my, my wife's not around and I'm having a meal and a chat with my daughters turned up on the set It's a good example of the way props make a difference and we had all of this fine china and I just said do you have some Tupperware and they went yeah I guess I said get a Tupperware fill it with leftovers it's you're having dinner with dad on the table you don't have to do all that shit and that to me was the kind of detail that really somehow sinks in watching it. You might not even be aware. So I know this isn't a direct answer, but those are the things, not the big moments, but the things like that, that I think are more emotionally telling, where you just think, fuck, that's like, that's what a dad would do. You know, the, the prop guy choosing the cutlery was thinking about, uh, you know, rice marshal, you know, or something, and all of the externals, a dad, Tupperware. You can eat that old turkey. You can even have the jello. Is there a bit of ice cream left? You know, that. I'm not saying that's my favorite scene, but those are the moments that I always really jumped on, you know? Yeah, well, that's why I said before, I thought many of the best scenes were you and your children, you know, Smith, yeah. Smith and his family. And uh, because that brought out, you know, this incredible, on the one hand, here's this high Nazi American official. On the other hand, he's just a human being, a father, mm -hmm. you know, with his with his children. Yeah. So, all right, listen, it's 427. And uh, let me just see if there are any other questions before we let Rufus go. Okay, here's a question from Tina who wants to know, why did Victoria choose Albert when Melbourne was so obviously the better choice? <laughs> a woman of great taste. Um, yeah, well, I mean, you know, you can't you can't fight history. You know, well, you can if you're doing Man in the High Castle, but it was, you know, wrong genre, I'm afraid for that. And yeah, well, uh, 
Yeah, it was it was it was it very similarly in a funny way because Jenna's a very close friend of mine. We got on so well, but then we did all our episodes with just me and her, and then um, Albert was on the scene in rehearsals. And it, I felt a little bit sad because I knew I was going to get the boot soon. And it was like, he was also really, really nice. But there was a little bit, not not in love terms or anything, but just in terms of me, my new pal and me having to be handed, ex, ex, replaced with a new pal. There was a couple of um, slightly mopey episodes as I got kicked out, you know, that I'm friends with. Him. Well, he was a little bit of a stiff. It's not the actor's fault, <laughs> the character's fault. But actually, let me then conclude this by saying, Another great Rufus Sewell role was as like a major vampire in Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer. And so you talk about history and alternate Hunter. history. That that basically is a good example of that. And that was what, like 2013? Yeah, that was fun. I'd never played a vampire before. I'd always wanted to play a vampire. Like, yeah. never say never. Like, there's no type of role that I wouldn't play. I'd play another bad. You just need to be well written, you know? Um, no, that was that was tremendous fun. There's an example of protecting the original script because the director, who's in, for whom English wasn't a first language or even thirteenth, um, he kept on coming up with ideas for me to say things that were terrible. He's a great visual director, but he'd say, "Oh, I have an idea. You say this," and I'd say, "No, I'm not going to." And I fought to keep my 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 line through that film as narrow as possible so it would make sense <laughs> yeah, well, he was coming up with he wanted me to be on a tricycle feeding you know meat eating plants and you know like, like <laughs> he was wonderful but no i had to fight to actually reduce my role from growing in the wrong way you know? um nemo has another question by the way go ahead he, if i'm allowed um I just had another question about one of your other roles. Um, your role as Petruchio in The Taming of the Shrew, profoundly- One of my favorite things I've ever done. That. Profoundly- when I come stuff that comes naturally to me. That's me at home. That is probably my most adored performance of yours. Um, okay. It profoundly affected me in high school, I will admit. Really? Um, yeah, seeing how incredibly confident you were. And I was just wondering, was it your idea to um, have Petruchio be as like as bold because I've seen other versions of the play where like he's played really shallowly which I never understood I really loved your portrayal as he was like very bold and I was just wondering if that was like all you and you were like I think Petruchio should be this way in which case I adored it it was incredible and also I had a question about his fashion if that was also your choice no but it was I couldn't have chosen that. that's what I would have chosen I mean um was it my choice no, very much in the writing. He was just this larger than life, but sensitive, but, you know, a thumper and a boozer, but but still kind of poetic and sweet. Um, all of those things. And I just like the idea of him being two giant sized people. Um, but the writing was there, you, you know, um, and in terms of the fashion, like I when I was 14, 13, I wore a lot of makeup. I've dressed like that myself. I was like, even kind of pre, I was really into David Bowie and I was very androgynous. Unfortunately, I was fat at the same time. So my brother, David Bowie was the thin white Duke and my brother used to call me the fat white Duke. Um, so I didn't look that good, but I gave it a fucking go. And I dyed my hair blonde when I was a 12 and I wore eyeliner and fingernail varnish and Victorian clothes and a feather in my ear. And I got, I got punched a lot by skinheads. Um, but there's an but I also was a fighter. So there's an element of that that was kind of a bit like me um, at a certain stage. But the clothes, she couldn't have get, I mean, it was, it was kind of strangely freeing, I have to say, I loved it. <laughs> Glad you liked it, because that's one of my favorite things. All right, so let's conclude with uh, actually a comment that Sal made. He talks about a quote uh, from uh, Juliana. Did you ever think how different life could be if you change just one thing. And then Sal says, the truth is that every decision we make changes our reality immediately. So let me conclude this wonderful interview by saying, uh, I am really glad that I made this decision. Let's see, this would have been back in October, uh, 2020. Rufus and I had been in touch talking about the final season of Man in the High Council. And then just out of the clear blue sky, I said uh, to Rufus, 
on Twitter, hey, I think I'm going to be teaching a class, you know, science fiction from page to screen this coming summer. It wasn't even definite then. It was just a proposal. How would you uh, like to come on for an interview and make the man in the high castle the centerpiece of that class? And uh, much to my delight, Rufus said yes. So uh, and I've been waiting here in this chair ever since in front of my laptop. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so one little decision made like in the middle of the night or whatever it was, I, I made it could have very good consequences.